this next section in section 21.1 is going to discuss rational functions and how we can go about graphing them. Now, if you recall from chapter four, we discussed that we had this library of functions. We talked about the constant, the identity, uh, constant slope, and we talked about this uh, square, cubic. The reciprocal function is what we're gonna be looking at here, anything that's a fraction. So you notice here that this graph produces some kind of funny looking things. We've got this kind of splitting in half here in the middle and going up to infinity and down to negative infinity. Uh, we've got it kind of leveling off at both ends. And so we're gonna discuss how we can figure out what that graph is going to do, where it's going to split, if it's going to split, and if it's got any of what we know as asymptotes. So first things first, let's define rational functions. So a rational function is any function which can be defined by a rational fraction. Uh, sometimes we refer to these as algebraic fractions. In which both the numerator and denominator are polynomials. And again, remember that a polynomial is just an expression involving x's to powers with coefficients, numerical coefficients. Um, it is important here that we make sure that uh, the coefficients are real numbers that we're going to be dealing with, um, but essentially we end up with something like a lot of times we'll write this as h of x is p of x over q of x, where p is a polynomial, q is a polynomial, and uh, the thing we always have to make sure of is that q stays within the domain, that those x values keep q um, from equaling zero. So uh, let's look at that. We want to find the domain, again, for a rational function. Uh, the domain means that the denominator cannot equal zero. So if we look here, real simple, x squared can't equal zero, so x can't equal zero. So our domain in this case is x such that x can't equal zero, or if we wanted to write it in set notation, we would be starting with negative infinity going to zero, we're going to put a parentheses because we're excluding it. Then we're going to union that, starting again at zero and going off to infinity. Again, we've got these parentheses here because we are not actually equaling infinity or negative infinity, and we're not actually equaling zero. We're essentially splitting that negative infinity to infinity at zero. So we put those parentheses in and union those two sets together. So uh, we've got uh, a graph here that we can use, and sorry again that not all the lines show up, uh, but what we want to do is we want to, you can either plot some points, or in this case, um, we can kind of follow the library of functions if you want to. Might be easier to graph some points. So for instance, if we pick, let's pick negative two, negative one, we already know zero isn't gonna work. Um, so if we pick negative three, negative two, negative one, we already know zero isn't going to work. So we'll pick one, two, and three. So if we plug negative three in, we get one over negative three squared, which is one ninth. Plug in two, you get one fourth. You plug in negative one, you get one over one, which is one. 
you plug one in, you get one, you plug two in, you get one fourth, and you plug three in, you get one ninth again. Uh, again, remember you're plugging into f of x, so f of negative three would be one over negative three squared, which is one ninth, so forth and so on. So if you look here um, at negative three, At negative three, we'll say is about there. We are at one ninth, which is really tiny, so we'll put it about there. And at negative two, we're not much better, we're at a quarter. And at negative one, all of a sudden we shoot up to one. And we could put some other values in, but you can kind of see how this is following this shape. Uh, likewise, at one, we are at one. At two, we are at a quarter again and at three we were down there at one ninth. So it's following that shape. So this is what our graph looks like. You could pull out your calculator if you wanted to. So if you put in one divided by x squared and you graph it, uh, you do see how you have that real steep asymptote there uh, and then it kind of levels out again. You can zoom in if you want to. You see it a little bit more like how we drew it. Uh, so what we can figure out here um, to find how this thing goes off to infinity or negative infinity is what is known as a limit. Uh, the limit can also sometimes help us find those asymptotes. So in math, when we talk about a limit, what we're talking about is the value that a function or sequence, which we'll talk about more in calculus, approaches as the input approaches some value. So essentially what we're trying to do is get as close as we possibly can to a point without actually touching it. And this is what happens when we look at a vertical asymptote. So we have some notation for the limit, uh, and that is the limit, we just put LIM, as X approaches A, some value of F of X equals L. And like I said, this is said as the limit as x approaches a of f of x. Sometimes you'll rearrange that the limit of f of x as x approaches a, either way is correct, um, is whatever value l is. Now let's talk about vertical asymptotes. Uh, limits are very helpful in finding vertical asymptotes. A uh, vertical asymptote is a vertical line, some call it an imaginary vertical line, which corresponds to the zeros of the denominator. of a rational function. Uh, that's what we're going to be dealing with at this point. They can show up for other things uh, such as trig functions. They show up with tangent functions, secant functions, cosecant functions, um, and sometimes with logarithmic functions and other things that have asymptotes. So, uh, but for right now we're just going to deal with those rational functions. Uh, if you're actually trying to visualize this, um, we could have, uh, while we mentioned up here, the limit can go to L, a number. It can also go to plus or minus infinity. So if we're talking about a vertical asymptote, that's what we're dealing with here. For instance, if we have the limit of f of x as x approaches, we'll say zero, and it goes to infinity, 
then what we have is that graph that we had up above with the 1 over x squared. Both of those lines are going up to infinity. Uh, some books will say that this does not exist um, uh, because you're going off to infinity. Uh, likewise, if instead we had the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x going to negative infinity, then we would look at 2 here. We'd have that imaginary line, uh, and we'd be going down to negative infinity in both cases. We can also have uh, graphs that go in both directions. Uh, usually they'll say that the limit does not exist for these, um, but we can also look at the limit from a side. For instance, if we look at the limit of f of x as x approaches 0 from the left, And that's what that little minus sign is up there. So if we approach from the left and we say it goes to infinity, then that means that our graph is going up to infinity on the left side as we approach zero. Whereas if we said we took the limit as x approaches zero from the right, and so that's what the little plus sign means, and we say that goes to negative infinity, then that would mean your graph is doing something like this, and it's going to negative infinity here as we approach from the right. And uh, like I said, if we kind of just put those together, though, if we have a graph that's going to negative infinity and positive infinity, uh, typically we say the limit of f of x as x approaches 0 in general does not exist. So those are our options. We can have both going up to positive infinity, we can have both going to negative infinity, or we can have them going in opposite directions. So how do we locate these vertical asymptotes? What we are going to do is a two-step process. We are first going to reduce the rational function lowest terms and we'll talk a little bit later on about what happens if we don't reduce it uh, but we want to make sure we reduce it and then we are going to find where the denominator equals zero So if we look at this first example here, x over x squared plus 1, we would say, okay, x squared plus 1, when does that equal 0? Well, you move the 1 over, you see that x squared equals negative 1. Well, that can't happen because you've got squared, which is positive, equaling a negative number. So that's gonna, not going to work. There are no vertical asymptotes in this case. You can just abbreviate that with VA. Now looking at this next example, x plus 8 over x plus 1, that is also reduced. Uh, so we look at the denominator. When does x plus 1 equal 0? Well, that happens at x equals negative 1. So this is our vertical asymptote. Uh, looking at this next example, 3x over x squared minus 4, it is reduced. We can't factor and simplify it all. Uh, so we'll look at the denominator. x squared minus 4 equals 0. And this is where you need to be careful. If you're going to go through and move the 4 over, you need to make sure that you're careful when you get rid of the squared. Uh, it's better if instead you factor, you say x plus 2, x minus 2 is equal to 0, because then this gives you your values of negative 2 and 2 that are your vertical asymptotes. And finally, if we look at this next one, it's not real clear to see if it's reduced. So we want to factor this one first. Uh, again, x squared minus 9 is going to factor into x minus 3, x plus 3. Uh, your denominator here is going to factor into x plus 7, x minus 3. Uh, that would give you your negative 21 and your positive 4x. Uh, and as you notice here, x minus 3 divided by x minus 3 gives you 1, so we can uh, simplify that fraction. And we'll talk about what happens there uh, in a moment. 
uh, but we're left with x plus 3 over x plus 7. And if you were, you were to graph the original function and x plus 3 over x plus 7, they would look exactly the same. Uh, in this case, again, you have to deal with x plus 7 equaling 0, so x equals 7 is your vertical asymptote. Now this one that simplified here, uh, you've got x minus 3 equals 0, or x equals 3 is going to give you the problem. Uh, this is actually going to create a hole in the graph. So what that means is if you were to graph this function on your calculator, you wouldn't even see that there's an issue. There's a pinprick hole that just it jumps over. So let's take a look at that real quick. So if we want to graph this thing, we need to make sure uh, that with the parentheses for the top and the bottom so that we keep them separate, otherwise we're just dividing the 9 and the x squared on the bottom. Uh, so we've got x squared minus 9, close parentheses, divided by x squared plus 4x minus 21. Again, you can always think of this division bar here as a big set of parentheses on the top and the bottom. That's what that means. So then if we close those parentheses, we hit graph, we should end up with something that looks like this. And uh, if you go to trace here, if you plug in the value 3, you will notice that it gives you a blank value for 3 because there's a hole in the graph. There is no value there. Even though it looks like there's something there, if you were to actually hit the back and forth button, it looks like the graph exists there, but it actually does not. There's a pinprick hole in the graph. It, it does not exist there. Uh, whereas you can see over here at uh, x equals negative 7 that we have that vertical asymptote. So over here, we've got that vertical asymptote at negative 7. So um, that's our discussion for vertical asymptotes. The next video will discuss horizontal asymptotes.